um, keeps yourself awake and makes it difficult to actually get the restorative sleep that we're, is so important. Um, you know, one of the things to remember trying to keep yourself in a good circadian rhythm, um, just make sure you avoid caffeine after 3 or 4 p.m. Gives you a good eight hours until you're trying to fall asleep. Gives you that time to uh, let the medication work itself out of your system. Um, another common drug that people don't think about in terms of sleep is, uh, is nicotine. So nicotine is also a stimulant. And even though uh, smoking is uh, decreasing in the United States, um, it's still something that has a propensity to disrupt your circadian rhythm, keep you awake at night, especially people who like to smoke towards the end of the day on their porch and relax. Um, something that is, uh, you know, bad for sleep. Bad for sleep architecture, excuse me. There we go, that's cool. One of the worst things about nicotine, though, is patients who are trying to quit tobacco. Um, this is also going to keep you up. Some patients recognize that uh, withdrawal symptoms, you can be shaky, jittery, and develop insomnia from coming off of the medication, or excuse me, coming off of nicotine. So this is something where, damned if you do, damned if you don't, um, something to keep in mind. I need a drink. Um, alcohol is one of those uh, drugs themselves that some patients will use to help themselves fall asleep. Somebody has a nightcap, lets them feel more relaxed at the end of the evening, um, and you feel that you're getting more restorative sleep. The problem is, even though someone may be unconscious after drinking alcohol, the sleep architecture is disturbed. So even though you're not awake, you're not getting that good restorative sleep to help protect brain chemistry, um, and prevent uh, you know, the manic and depressive episodes we were talking about earlier. Another issue with alcohol is chronic use. Um, over time, makes it more and more difficult to, to fall asleep without the alcohol. Um, so you get caught constantly trying to catch up to drink to fall asleep. You're tired the next day. More and more alcohol leads to more and more problems. Uh, the good news is after you know, 30 to 60 days of abstinence from alcohol, um, most of the sleep architecture is restored from, you know, before you started drinking. Um, cannabis use in the United States is on the rise and something that, just like alcohol, many people utilize to relax at the end of the day, try to help themselves fall asleep, and try to help them get some more rest. But, also like alcohol, it disrupts the sleep architecture. So, while you may feel that you are unconscious, once again, you're not actually getting restorative sleep. Paradoxically, one of the side effects of a drug that is supposed to calm you down is making you more anxious and paranoid, and this in and of itself can lead to worsened sleep and worsened, uh, worsened rest. Also like nicotine, if someone is trying to um, stop using cannabis, they're gonna feel uh, more awake while they're going through that withdrawal period. Um, I don't think I have to tell you that cocaine and uh, methamphetamine will uh, you know, keep you awake and, and give you a buzz, but it is something that is often not as thought about, especially when, uh, unfortunately, patients who are uh, in the midst of a manic episode tend to seek out some of these stimulant medications because it promotes that, that euphoric feeling, uh, especially towards the end of the episode. If you feel really good, you want to keep feeling good. Um, so this is both a uh, symptom and a cause of some of those disordered sleep in the manic episodes. Um, and then if you go into any CVS, any Publix, um, any Walgreens, you're gonna see a lot of medications that uh, uh, mark themselves as sleeping aids. Um, things like NyQuil, Benadryl, uh, Tylenol PM all have uh, variations of the same type of medications. Um, we know NyQuil has the, if you are not awake, you cannot have a cold medicine. Um, it is one that does put you to sleep. However, much like alcohol over time, chronic use of these medications can, uh, one, develop a tolerance, and two, further disrupt the sleep architecture, um, making it very difficult to have that good, natural, restorative sleep that um, we need for our mental health.
for my section of the presentation, I'm going to talk about sleep hygiene. So this is rather than being geared towards like a manic episode specifically or depressive episode specifically, this is just kind of general good advice for good sleep habits. Um, obviously applies in mood episodes as well, but um, you know this is essentially like a summary of the sleep advice that I give all of my patients. So. Some general tips, um, Dr. Holmes, you just talked about like pay attention to what you're eating, pay attention to what you're drinking. So we talked about caffeine, alcohol. Um, now caffeine does, it's interesting because some people are able to drink it right before bed and go to sleep. There's a lot of like interpersonal variability there. The half-life of caffeine is five hours, about. So like that's why there's such a wide, one of the reasons there's such a wide variability um, in Dr. Holmes' slide when you saw like the amount of time before bed that you need to stop drinking caffeine, it not only depends on how your individual like body metabolizes it, but the amount of caffeine you're drinking. So let's say you have a venti Starbucks latte at noon. Um, at 5 p.m., it's still like if you had had half of a venti, like that, that amount of caffeine is still in your system. So then another five hours later, 10 p.m., you still have like, maybe like that much of the caffeine in your system. So for an average person, but that'll depend on, on individuals somewhat as well. But that gives you an idea of like, okay, like even if I have a coffee at lunch, there is a possibility it could still be impacting your sleep, depending on how big the coffee is. This is something I've learned from personal experience, by the way, so. Um, Another thing to think about is eating. So I know a lot of us have really busy schedules. It can be hard to schedule our meals like several hours before we go to bed, but that is based on what we know um, about how you know our bodies work, the hormones that are released, so on. Um, that that tends to bode for better sleep. Um, it's also you know a good thing to think about if you haven't ever wake up and you feel like heartburn, anything like that, if you're eating like right before bed because you're reclined like this, um, your stomach acid is easier to like get up through the stomach into the throat area. So that's another reason we say don't eat large meals before bed. Reflux could keep you up at night and just having a large meal can sometimes keep you up. Um, okay, so <laughs> this is, I think, something that we all struggle with. Um, what do you do in bed? Hopefully you're sleeping, but I bet most of us in this room have done one or multiple of these things on this list. So speaking for myself, definitely in college, I would sit on my laptop and watch Netflix and do my work, um, Skype with my friends until, you know, whatever, midnight, and then I'd be bummed because I couldn't go to sleep and I was tired the next morning. So, it may feel great like while you're doing it, and I mean, like I said, totally understand, have been there, but it can hurt your ability to sleep. There's a couple different reasons for this. So with the electronics, including like watching TV in bed, um, playing on your phone in bed, there is a component of blue light in the screens and blue light um, is what our brains naturally use to tell us when we should be sleeping. Um, so for like, let's go back and pretend we're like a caveman, okay? So you're a caveman and the sun is setting, there's less blue light, your brain starts releasing melatonin, it's telling you like, okay, it's like nighttime, it's time for you to rest, time to go to sleep. In our modern world, we have lots of blue light that's not from the natural world, so instead of our brain's telling us like, okay, sun's going down, less blue light, time to sleep. We just keep giving ourselves blue light, watching TV on our phones, so on. So you don't get as a robust um, of a melatonin release. So your brain is not getting as much of a signal to tell you to sleep, which then can lead to sleep problems. Um, another component of this that has nothing to do with melatonin is just the propensity of the human brain to create patterns of behavior. So believe it or not, your brain kind of 
learns to associate certain activities with certain states. Um, so the thought is like if you are in bed reading um, or eating or studying, your brain is then associating that space, your bed, with like doing those activities. So it thinks like, okay, like this is the place where I do, um, hopefully, probably no one's doing their taxes in bed, because that's not the last thing, but we'll say like, oh yeah, this is like where I do my Sudoku, or this is where I study. Um, your brain learns that. So then when you try, you're like, okay, I'm trying to go to sleep now. The brain doesn't have that signal of like, okay, like I'm in this bed, the lights are off, I'm supposed to be asleep. It gets kind of confused. So um, one thing I say to my patients that uh, one, of, one of my mentors, I heard him say it once and it, it stuck with me, was like, bed is for sex and sleeping. You should only be like having sex or sleeping in your bed, not reading, doing any of those other things. I know it's super hard, guys, I get it, but um, it, it works. And you know, there are, with the caveat, there are some people who are able to do things other than sex and sleep in bed and still, like, still sleep. But if you're having, if you're a person who's having sleep problems, it's a good consideration to like think about these things. Like, okay, thinking about changing some of these habits, seeing if that helps. Okay, um, evaluating your sleeping environment. Unfortunately, you know, depending on your circumstances, there's some things about this you're not going to be able to change. You have noisy neighbors, you can't change that. You live like next to a road that has a lot of noise, you can't change that. Um, but some things that you can do. So there are studies that show um, lowering the ambient temperature of your environment by a few degrees can help with inducing sleep, helping you have a, a more restful sleep. So if like turning down your air conditioning or your thermostat's not an option. You can also consider like using a fan um, to help cool that environment a little bit. Um, the fan also is a good source of white noise. So I have a lot of uh, patients that I, you know, recommend turning on the fan just for the white noise or getting a white noise machine that can help drown out some of those like environmental noises that might, you know, maybe you don't even consciously register them bothering you when you're trying to sleep, but Sometimes, sometimes they can wake you up or disrupt your sleep even if you're not aware of it, per se. And then finally, light. So I don't know about anybody else, but I, I do love my windows in my room. I like looking up to the light. But the negative is sometimes if I see a street light like flicker or something happens in the middle of the night, like it, it, does, it does wake me up. So the darker your room is, the better for your sleep also goes back to that whole blue light thing. So telling your brain, dark, sleep time. Um, you can consider if, you, if you're not in a place where you can modify the environment to decrease the amount of light in the room, um, you could try wearing like a sleep mask. That sometimes helps. Um, blackout curtains are something I think a lot of us residents have invested in when we're on like night shifts and things, we can sleep during the day. So there's lots of like, different practical ways that you can modify the environment to try to make it better for your sleep. Exercise. So everything, you know, I feel like we, we talk about sleep, exercise, diet all the time. Um, so exercise is not only good in and of itself for your mental health, but it does also help you have better sleep. So uh, we recommend exercising every day if you can. Try not to do any intense exercise right before bed because that can be stimulating and keep you awake. But if you can do it sometime during the day, like even a little bit of exercise, then you know exercise. Um, if you wanted to do something physical before bed, uh, you could try something like yoga, tai chi, stretching, a more calming, so in other words, like not intense cardiovascular. So we, we alluded to this a couple times already in the presentation, but circadian rhythms, habits, natural cycles, very important in establishing good sleep. Um, you know, I know I like to sleep down on the weekends, but I also know it's not good for my sleep schedule because our bodies, again, learn. They learn when they're supposed to be asleep, when they're supposed to be awake. 
So the more consistent we can be with that, the better it is to cement those good, strong, sweet habits. Um, so the advice that I give people, they're telling me like, you know, I'm having trouble, um, you know, getting to sleep or I'm having trouble waking up in the morning. I'll say, okay, so I know, I know this, this stuff will sound fun, but I would recommend trying to go to bed at the same time every night, wake up at the same time every day, even on days when you're not working. Uh, unfortunately, that can be really hard with shift work, but you just you do the best you can. And even in some extreme cases, I have recommended to patients to try to consider switching their shifts if, if they can, or like getting out of shift work and, and extreme situations where the sleep just isn't getting any better no matter what they seem to be doing. So that's like how, how important and how serious having a consistent sleep routine can be for getting to sleep. Okay, so speaking of sleep routines, so th this is just an example. Um, and making one of these if you're struggling with sleep or even if you're just trying to find a way to get some better sleep is, is something I highly recommend. So what I typically say is to use about an hour of time before you want to go to sleep as like relaxation time. So turn off your electronics, get rid of blue light, um, start signaling to your brain that it's like time to cool down. Uh, do something not in your bed, but that is calming. So uh, for example, you know, uh, read, a, read a book, uh, do like a quiet craft activity, listen to a mu like the music you like, listen to a podcast. A lot of people just enjoy kind of taking a leisurely nighttime hygiene routine, you know, like taking a shower and, and doing, you know, whatever uh, they, they do before bed. Um, you know, then that goes into the nighttime hygiene. And then set a time where you're gonna get in the bed. And then hopefully, you know, if you're following a lot of the, the sleep hygiene tips, you'll be asleep within 15 minutes. Does that always happen? No. But that, that would be an ideal situation. So a lot of people are like, this is a lot of information, and I do all of these things that you're telling me not to do. So I don't know where to start. Okay, that's fine. Um, a great place to start is making a sleep diary. Uh, so Dr. Dolan did talk about uh, like smart watches, things like that, that can help you keep track of your sleep. Those can be really helpful. Um, I actually recommend if you're able to, doing a sleep diary by hand. So you're like, why? Why would I do that if I have a watch that tells me when I'm sleeping? Well, it actually helps you be more mindful of when you're sleeping. So it forces you to sit down and actually think about like, okay, how did I sleep last night? Okay, how many times did I wake up? Okay, how much, what was I actually doing when I wasn't asleep or in bed? Was I sitting there? Was I worried? Was I thinking about stuff? Was there noise going on outside? It, it makes you actually think about what's going on instead of just looking at your watch and being like, oh, it says I got four sleep last night and I woke up five times. Um, in your sleep diary, you can include as many pieces of information or like get as basic as you want. So some things you might consider, um, your electronics use when you're on your phone, uh, exercise, meal times, caffeine, alcohol, medicines. This can be especially important for anybody who has comorbid ADHD, anybody who takes stimulant medicines, or honestly, if you have any changes in medicines and you're thinking, huh, like, I don't know, has my sleep gotten worse since I started taking this? I'm not sure. Um, writing down when you're taking those things, seeing if there's any correlation between when you're taking them or medication changes and changes in your sleep can be really helpful for you and for your doctor. Um, starting your sleep environment, we already talked about that. So doing that every day for one to two weeks and then evaluating it, like looking at the whole picture, seeing if you can identify any patterns as to, you know, when are the nights that I'm not getting good sleep or what is happening that I'm not getting good sleep. Um, this is a, an example of a free PDF that you can print out from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. Uh, this is the one that I usually print out for people and um, <coughs> to fill out and bring back to their appointment in two weeks if they're having difficulty sleeping. Um, just one example of many, you can make 
your own and shit. There's a lot of other ones online, but you can you can see on here. Okay. Well. The poster got tired. Yes, it did. <laughs> that was boring. I can fly. Um, so you, you can see here like some of the. This is exercise. A is for alcohol. The shaded boxes are when you're either asleep at night or taking a nap during the day. And then this is for when you're trying to go to bed to be like, asleep for the night. So that's that's when you get, get in bed. So in this example, this box and this box are where the person was laying in bed and not sleeping. If you're laying in bed, if you notice a lot of these, like that you're laying in bed a lot and you're not asleep, Again, same concept of your brain learns to associate bed with not sleeping. So what we recommend is you lay there for about like 10 minutes. If you're still not feeling sleepy, you're still not able to go to sleep, get up, do a quiet activity in a low light environment until you start to feel tired, then go back to bed. <clears throat> so trying to reinforce in your brain, tired, sleep, bed. I know it sounds simple, Sounds kind of silly when you know people are having a lot of trouble sleeping to like just give these pieces of advice, but I, I promise you it can be really, really helpful. So rest and sleep. That is all, all I have in my slides. Um, happy to answer any questions about like specific, you know, sleep hygiene issues. I was going to walk around with the mic if anybody. Oh, okay. A lot of times you can't hear people when they talk questions. So, uh, excellent, excellent lecture tonight. Great topic. Uh, we're all going to take stuff away from this, I know. Um, we a lot of times at the support groups we we always talk about journaling, and the American Academy of Sleep Medicine uh, chart is a great thing. You compile the data and you impress the heck out of your doctor. Those of you who are on a treatment plan with a psychiatrist, you bring that in and uh, it'll be a whole new added dimension to your uh, your treatment. So uh, you can imagine, uh, uh, you know, as a species, 100,000 years of evolution, uh, and it's only the last 75 years that we've dealt with radio and television and now phones and things, uh, it explains a lot with uh, the bloom of behavioral health issues, probably a lot more than there used to be. When people uh, went to bed at night, maybe just with a fire or something, and then a candle, and then went to bed. But um, anybody have any questions that I'd like to ask the doctor? This is a great moment here, so go ahead. Um, I found it interesting um, talking about sleep disturbances outside of an episode. Um, I know that I, I can really relate to that, and. Um, I was just uh, wondering, is there any way, like, I, I feel like I'm always on some sort of sleep cycle, uh, sleep cycle that <coughs> I'm sleeping too much or sleeping too little. Is there any way to reduce that kind of roller coaster of sleep, even though it's not, you know, a manic or a depressive episode? That's fine. Um, you can turn it back on. I hate the microphone. Oh, okay. right. um, you know, everybody is going to be different, and it's something I definitely recommend you speak with your doctor about. However, even just the simple tips of creating a routine, trying to get into the structure that Dr. Damon was talking about, um, can help reduce the impact of some of those sleep disturbances. Uh, and more importantly, if you do get uh, knocked off your sleep cycle, getting back on it is going to be uh, quicker and easier with. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, using you know a lot of the, 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 the tips to create a good sleeping environment, making sure that you're going to bed when you're sleep or when you're tired and only when you're tired um, is going to be one of the best ways to, to fix that sleep architecture. Um, and even if you get knocked uh, out of your circadian rhythm, you're out of your normal sleep cycle using some of these tips are what's gonna help bring you back quicker and faster. So 
there's not one magic piece. Good sleep is good sleep. Um, it's all about building the habit. I've heard, uh, you know, just thinking about sleep and um, how you're talking about it's a can be a precursor to a manic episode, um, and I can definitely relate to that. Where if you go through a few nights of not having sleep, you could it could turn into something more. Um, and I was just wondering, what do you? I've heard of, you know I've heard manic episodes described as like a train leaving the station, where it's you know, kind of slow to start, and once it gets going, it's hard to stop. And I guess if you have that few nights of no sleep and you think it might lead to a manic episode, what do you suggest that you do? So, I mean, oftentimes I think that, you know, it would be appropriate to schedule, try to get in sooner um, with the doctor, especially a psychiatrist or a primary care doctor, if you notice that that pattern starting to emerge. Because oftentimes, you know, like you mentioned, there is that slower start and then it, it gets out of control fast. And sometimes people, um, they, they lose a bit of insight as things start to really speed up. You know, in that beginning stage when they, or their family or friends start to notice the sleep is, is kind of poor, um, they're, they're staying up later, they're doing social activities they wouldn't otherwise do, and they're not complaining of feeling tired. You know, I think that that's a really crucial moment for um, friends, family, or the patients themselves to kind of step in and say, I probably need to, you know, go to my doctor. Um, because some of the things that we can do, and, and some of the things that we kind of didn't mention here, is also the impact of prescribed medications. Having somebody who can kind of go through and reconcile all of the meds and all of the kind of supplements that you've been on. Because there are some things that we prescribe people that are a little bit more on the activating side including sometimes um, the medications that we use to, to treat things like depression and bipolar. You know, there are some medications that work a bit more on dopamine receptors or norepinephrine receptors, and sometimes those can make people feel a bit more activated or have trouble sleeping, especially if they start taking the medication maybe later on in the day, right? Let's take uh, Wellbutrin, for instance. It's a bit of an activating antidepressant, and sometimes if people aren't really counseled thoroughly or maybe they forget, uh, the counseling, they might take it, you know, a little bit later, like, oh, my doctor said to take this daily, so I'm going to take it in the afternoon. And they might not realize that that's part of what's making it harder to sleep at night. Um, and then there's other other impacts of medications, right? Things like ortazepine is often very helpful for sleep. It's an antidepressant, but it's pretty sedating. Um, you know, there are a lot of medication changes and, and ways that medications can interact with each other that you know, a psychiatrist or a PCP might be able to step in and say, oh, this makes sense as to why you're feeling this way. You're taking this medication a bit later on in the day, or you know, maybe you're taking it um, just in a different way than what we ideally recommend. Um, they might be able to take a comprehensive look at things, maybe increase medications, make dose adjustments, so that things kind of don't get out of hand. Um, I think that would also be so another thing that um, it depends, you know, on on how your relationship is with with your psychiatrist, with your prescribing physician. But sometimes I've I've had cases with people who have bipolar disorder who are, are more like rapid cycling. So I've seen like multiple manic episodes within the course of a, a year of treatment, where um, you know I talk to the patient I'm like, listen, like this is happening a lot. Like what can we do to when you start to see these symptoms? Like what can we do to try to minimize the effects of, of what's happening? So what what we had come up with, and you know, you consider consider asking your physician about this as well. It's like okay, can we make a plan for like if I notice X Y Z symptoms? Like can we make a plan and agree on what I what I need to do? Like what can I do that's going to help? So in the case of my patient, I was comfortable enough with treating this person that I said like hey. This, this is the medicine that has been most helpful for you in getting out of manic episodes in the past. I want you to bump up this medication, this amount, when you start to notice the symptoms. And again, like that was that was a very much like individual me decision as a provider. Like I felt comfortable doing that. Um, another thing that we did in that particular case was um, we made a plan with my patient and uh, their significant other. Um, 
so that could work with you know anybody that you really trust as far as you know okay if if i start experiencing these symptoms i'm going to tell my significant other i'm going to give the control of my bank account to my significant other you know depending on what what tends to be the most problematic for people during those episodes you can come up with an individualized plan of like before i get to a point where i don't have any insight this is what i'm going to do to try to minimize any damage that might happen so that's another way you can approach it thank you all for that's really helpful uh excellent uh suggestion with uh, you know a lot of times we we're afraid to go back to our doctor or bother the doctor in between visits but if you're feeling a mania starting, um, call your doctor, see if he can get in to see you. Um, have a good relationship with your doctor. Uh, and that's, that's it's important to, uh, to get the most out of your, your treatment. So uh, a question, of, we have time for a couple more questions, perhaps? Hello everyone. My name is Omar. I attend Tampa DBS USF. This is actually our room here. So we welcome you and thank you for coming. Uh, I have a question about um, just sleep in general. Growing up, I think we can all tell when we undersleep or oversleep. We feel exhausted or feel groggy from oversleeping. So there's a familiar feeling from oversleeping. And for many years, when I oversleep, it'd be like hour nine or 10, 10, 12 hours. It's a familiar groggy feeling. So as I age and grow older, I notice that's coming sooner and sooner now. So, and, and we hear when you go older, you sleep less, so I guess that's why. But it's, it's like coming much sooner now. So for the past decade, I'm pushing 50 now. So for the past decade, five, five and a half hours is enough sleep. Now I wake up sometimes at four hours and I feel groggy. So that's something that's concerning. I don't know if it's just a fake feeling or, because there's no way that the four hours is enough sleep. And I wake up, um, not refreshed, so I don't have what you're talking about, the energy. I still feel tired, but not like, like what I'm used to feeling what tired is, you know, with the burning eyes and actually you can go back to sleep just groggy and slow, where it's obvious I didn't sleep enough. But like I said before, that groggy feeling never came until I used to sleep like 10, 12, 11 hours. So that's something I've been thinking about. Thank you, Omar. Uh, any suggestions from the doctors about that? I think uh, everybody's different as far as uh, not sleeping and as you get older. And it's true, uh, I'm almost 70, so I, I sleep like four or five hours a night sometimes, you know. Uh, but um, I guess just... Uh, yeah, so, so uh, certainly the amount of sleep that you need, um, you know, infants sleep 20 hours a day, children seem to never sleep, teenagers sleep all the time, and then as we age, that the, the number of hours you're gonna need for a restorative night's sleep um, can decrease, but but also something to remember is we we talked a lot about here about disorganized sleeping. We've talked about some of the substances that can impact your sleep, but there's a whole host of other conditions that can cause you to feel tired, to feel groggy. Um, even if you're unconscious, you may not be getting that restorative sleep. So that's something that you know I'd recommend you speak with either a psychiatrist or your primary care physician about maybe a sleep study or. Um, other interventions to see what might be going on um, if you're not feeling, you know, well rested. Sleep studies, good thing, right? Um, anybody else? Uh, Eva? Kind of along that 
tangent. I have a question if you've noticed any other conditions that may agitate sleep, such as a deviated septum. Yeah. There's a lot. <laughs> 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 uh, symptoms, obstructive sleep apnea, um, you know, any type of aches and pains, joint uh, discomfort. I, I would bet there's at least one or two of you in here who has back pain right now. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of different uh, uh, medical uh, comorbidities that can impact how you're sleeping. Um, not to mention like we were talking about before the environment you're sleeping in. Um, there, there's a lot that goes into this. And this is hopefully you know a window into what sleep medicine specialists do, but they have a broad range of things to, to look into. Yeah, and just some like warning signs that I throw out there that are definitely like red flag, like talk to a physician would be things like if you're falling asleep, um, not always necessarily while driving, but maybe even when you're the passenger of a car, or if you have ever fallen asleep just kind of while sitting talking to somebody, um, if you tend to fall asleep like after after eating a nice lunch, if you find yourself needing to nap during the day pretty often, um, you know these are things that that really warrant um, a sleep study probably because they're they're not normal, um, and sometimes people are surprised to learn that they have sleep apnea. You know, I think that people have kind of a stereotype in mind of who gets sleep apnea, what age, you know, what body type, but it's really found in people of many ages, with many body types, many activity levels, and people are often surprised at how much something like a CPAP can help them. And not only their, their feeling of restorative sleep, but also things like, you know, waking up with a headache, waking up with a sore throat, these things are uncomfortable, they affect your mood, they make it harder to, you know, regulate mood, uh, irritability with others. So those are things that, you know, we often kind of scream using certain questions about how sleepy somebody is during the day. Um, and those are used to guide uh, sleep studies. All right, thank you, doctors. Uh, uh, okay. no. Hi, I'm Sean, I'm the facilitator for the USF group. I got a question about, you mentioned the Tylenol and the PM and the NyQuil and all that. What are your thoughts on the melatonin, artificial me melatonin and the, like the z stuff, the stuff that's not made for colds or anything, but made to help you sleep? So I very specifically avoided giving direct med uh, recommendations on medications because that's gonna be an individual decision between you and, and your doctor. Um, you know, the melatonin tends to be one of the less intrusive uh, medications you can take. Um, but I can say that the, the z is um, the same medication as either, uh, I think it's NyQuil, the, the sleeping time in NyQuil, so it's gonna have a similar effect. Very good. Uh, two hours later and then I've been like just up and then I'll fall back to sleep and then do that again like should I just like try and do some kind of activity for a bit or something when I do that too okay yeah so oh let me turn it off again so doing doing what I talked about um, with the sleep hygiene is a good place to start so I, I would recommend starting there now if, if if you're doing that and then you're finding like I'm not making any progress, like I'm still having trouble, I would say definitely talk to your doctor. So when when we're talking in medical terms, we talk about sleep onset, you know, getting to sleep initially, and sleep maintenance, which is staying asleep. Um, and we have different interventions, medicine-wise, that can target both of those. Um, okay. So if you find you know you're doing the behavioral interventions and they're not working, definitely go talk to your physician. Okay. All right, I think we're getting close to the end here. Um, excellent, excellent lecture tonight. Um, so sleep is the 800 pound gorilla in the room. I think it makes a lot of sense that people don't think about that. You have a psychiatric diagnosis, things aren't working out with your medication. Is it your sleep? Maybe your sleep is, is not right. You need that sleep hygiene. Um, so uh, very important stuff. Great, great uh, comments, great questions. Um, 
So uh, I want to thank the doctors tonight. I'm going to turn the light on here. Oops. And um, as we usually do, I want to present the doctors with uh, Dr. Denman, a Community Service Award for coming and visiting with us tonight here, uh, Dr. Holmesy and Dr. Dolan. Thank you so much, doctors. Dr. Whitehead for uh, arranging things too as well. So, and, uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, I wanted to mention before you go, we have uh, our organization now has a lot self-help library. We probably have the largest collection of self-help books on the west coast of Florida. If you go to our website, you can you can look at the books. Go to the library section, and then you can see all the books. We just ordered about 16 more books. So uh, we're very pleased and proud to have that added dimension to the organization. So um, we can all talk as we're leaving. We have, uh, if you have, want any more information, we can give it to you. We also have uh, lecture, I mean, um, uh, pamphlets and, and uh, handout sheets in the back of the room. Uh, we have seven weekly in-person meetings. We have an eighth one starting in Venice, Florida in about two weeks. Um, we have one online group, so there's nine meetings a week for our organization. Um, so if you uh, go to our website, it has a pretty comprehensive website. It has 10 pages to it. Uh, there's a lot of information on there. Um, and uh, we'll see how the video comes out tonight. We'll probably have a, a parts of this video or all the video. Uh, we want to thank you very much. We're very proud and honored to, to be here uh, at, at the school and, and have uh, doctors like yourselves come and uh, talk. So it's a very valuable situation. How often do you get to have four psychiatrists sitting here uh, and, and be able to talk to them? Not very often, so uh, really appreciate it. So thank you very much. Thank you.